Welcome to the Liberati Mansion. Welcome to Under the Vegas Sun, looking at the people, the events, and the news surrounding Las Vegas and the entire Vegas Valley. Hello, I'm Steve Shore. We are live from the Liberace Mansion. Being an entertainer in Las Vegas is not as easy as some people think. And being a comedian in Las Vegas, I think, is even tougher. On our program today, you'll meet a man who not only is a performer in Las Vegas, not only a comedian in Las Vegas, but he came here from England and is now making it pretty big. His name is Paul Scally. You'll meet him in just a moment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Eamon Springall of Stitched at the Cosmopolitan, and you're watching Under the Vegas Sun with Steve Shore. It has been said that laughter is the best medicine. It can also be the worst medicine, depending on who's making you laugh, I guess. Our very special guest on the program today is a man who does just that, make you laugh. Well, he does a lot more than that, but make you laugh is his thing. His name, Paul Scally. Welcome to our program. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. I appreciate being here. First of all, you've appeared in many, many different venues in the world, mm -hmm. many different venues in Las Vegas. Did you ever think you'd appear in the living room of Liberace. I never thought, and uh, I still can't <laughs> believe I'm here right now, actually. Like, I'm really here. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? Yeah. It's like your hair. So what is with your hair? Uh, I'm, I have to start there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know what? So I, I actually got my hair cut last week, and I called my hairdresser, and I said, hey, it's getting hot, I need a really? haircut. Really? call him back. No, well, <laughs> this is the thing. He, I walked in, and he said, oh, man, your hair. And I said, what? I said, yeah, it needs cut. He said, no, you look... Uh, you look like Batman, or, you know, Bateman, the guy who does that. And he, uh -huh. he, now, my hairdresser doesn't have hair, yeah? There's a reason. That's the reason. So he was getting <laughs> exactly. cut with my hair. So I said, OK, I'll just go with it for a week. And, you know, if, uh, if I need a haircut, I'll, I'll text you. Uh, I, as soon as I left, I, I went home and I texted him. I said, I, you know, I think I need my haircut. And he's like, I'm booked out for 10 days. There's, there's a time in our lives, I think for most of us, that we think, you know, I'm going to be an engineer, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be a firefighter, I'm going to be a whole bunch of things. Was there a time in your life, Paul, when you said, I want to really want to be a comedian? And, and, and if you did say that, what drove you to that? I asked myself that most days, like, why this? Why did I get involved? I, I always wanted to uh, make people laugh and perform and be on stages. Have you done that? <laughs> what made the people <laughs> laugh? I've been on the stages, I don't know about the other part. So, you know, I, I think I, I always wanted to do it. I, I always wanted someone to listen to me, whether I was making them laugh or not. I think I wanted some attention. That's where it, that's where it came from. Okay, so you're a young man from Surrey, England. Okay, yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Um, now living in the United States, in Las Vegas. There's a long place, a long way from Surrey, England to Las Vegas. As a matter of fact, your town is where they used to do uh, a race similar to the 24 Hours at Le Mans, if I'm not mistaken, in, in that, in, yeah. in your town. Yeah. Uh, so there's a long place from there to here. What made you think and what made you believe that Las Vegas and America was the place for Paul Scali? I always, I always was fascinated with America and coming to the US. So when, um, when I had the chance, I would come and I used to do a lot of uh, the cruise ships, w w which would keep me in the country. And then I would, I, I would stick around. Uh, n didn't really have any, any you know, eyes set on Vegas. Um, I, I was on the East Coast or I was uh, you know, down in Miami or wherever. And um, then I came to Vegas about 10 years ago and I looked at it and I thought, wow, you're way overwhelming. And how do, you, how do you get into Vegas? Probably not going to happen. And then uh, a few years later, I, I actually decided, right, I'm just going to come out here and, uh, and, and give the town a, a, a shoot and hustle. And that's what actually, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm still doing today. There's a lot of people, Paul, that look at Las Vegas and they go, wow, you know, Las Vegas is a great place to visit, good place to gamble, good place to see some shows, maybe now, good place to see some great sports. 
a lot of people are now saying, hey, you know, Las Vegas may be not that bad of a place to live. You're a family man. You have a young daughter. Uh, a lot of people see Las Vegas as maybe not the place to, to raise a child. How do you see Las Vegas? How do you, how do you and your family make this your home now when living in Surrey, England is such a far cry from what Las Vegas is? That's good. Um, yeah, it's definitely, you, you need discipline to live in this town. And that's what I found out very early because I wanted, I wanted to be out on the strip and in the shows and we all know that's, you know, in the evening, sometimes you have to do two shows a night. So you're out late and then, and you're in an environment where everyone's on vacation, on holiday, they're in a fantasy, but you have to go home at the end of the night. And yeah, if you've got a daughter or if you're, you're running the business side of it as well, you've got to wake up early in the morning to take care of all that and a family and then yourself. So I, um, I take myself out of the, um, the fantasy side of it. I come, I do a show and then I'm, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I'm, I'm at home drinking a cup of tea, watching Netflix. But your daughter is old enough now to understand what daddy does. Yeah. I would think. Yeah. How do, how do you respond to your daughter when she says, what do you do, daddy, when you go away at night? Yeah, so, well, so she, sometimes she says, don't go. Or, or <laughs> really, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, she'll say, don't go. You know, it, it, it's just coming, you know, if, if I have to leave before she has to go to bed or if it's just about bedtime or I have to say good you know, night to her and then I'm going out then she'll, she'll hear the doors and the, hey, have you gone yet? Or she'll even say, do this tonight, dad. And then she'll do a funny little dance. Do that, that'll make them laugh. Do that on the stage, you know. And like she, is she really? She does that, yeah, yeah. She, you know, hey, you know, come here, do this. And, you know, and then like she'll like smack herself or, or it's, it's pretty cute. There is a time for every comedian, I would presume, where probably one of the toughest things you have to do is go on the road. Uh, go to little towns and across America being a comedian, trying to, trying to get your craft to where it needs to be. I'm sure now that you call Las Vegas home, it's a little bit better for you, better for your wife, better for your family. How tough is it being a comedian and being on the road and trying to, trying to sell this profession, and I'll call it that because it is a profession that you have to be successful enough where you can, you can play Las Vegas? Yes, yeah, so what I had to do, especially the biggest thing is I had to uh, translate or re rewrite everything that I did or was doing in the UK and they had to bring it to America and although I, you know most of the time people enjoyed this this different type of accent or personality sometimes I would I wouldn't hit the crowd it was wrong because I didn't I couldn't go deep in with my own youth and stuff to talk about how I was grown up because people can't relate to it in, in the US and England Surrey very very different so yeah I did I had to I had to go to some weird towns and do some weird shows being away sounds good, and again, t to my early self, if someone told me that, all right, you're going you're gonna to be doing a show in Reno, Nevada, then Las Vegas, and then to LA, and you're doing it w within the space of, let's say, four or five days, and you're going to be driving, well, that sounds cool, that's a, that's a road trip, wow, that's insane. But then when you do the hours on your own in that car, or ho however, I mean, you know, you want to fly, but sometimes flying isn't the, you know, because then you don't have a car when you get to where you've got to be. And, that, and that's not the places like o Olathe, Kansas, or Sheboygan, Wisconsin, or, <laughs> or little places in the world that have comedy clubs yeah. where comedians really are, are, are paying their dues. Yeah, and, and, and funny you should say Wisconsin, because I did, I, I did like Appleton, Wisconsin. Appleton, did, Wisconsin. Appleton, yeah. I was in... An Ma Englishman in Appleton. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like an oxymoron, I'm sorry. It, it totally is. Well, I was living <laughs> in a place called Francis Creek, uh, which is a town population of like 17 people. And then I was uh, in the Midwest, completely out of like, you know, my comfort zone and everybody else's around me. I would walk into any store or any place and they were like, why are you here? And then I would explain. Very nice people. Some of the nice people in America out there. Probably one of the toughest places I would think to work. I'll give three. Probably some of the toughest places to work would be New York City, yeah. LA, and Las Vegas. Las Vegas, I would think, out of all of them, would be the toughest because the amount of comedians calling residency Las Vegas their place 
has grown substantially over the past 10 years. And, and, and there's comedy clubs around the corner. There are places where you can see comedy tonight, tomorrow, this afternoon even. How does that play for Paul Scally? How much, how much is staying on top of your game the hardest thing that you have to do? Well, yeah, because big headliners, if you, if you don't have mass fame, or you're a YouTube sensation right now, or you, you know, lots of people don't know you through social media or, or, or another platform, source, whatever it may be. People don't really care. They want to come and they want to see Jim Gaffigan or Tim Allen tonight or whoever, or they want to see a Cirque show. So to, to be a David draw, Spade. David Spade, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, or you know, like, like big actors. Rita Rudner. Yeah, you know, these big, big names. Big names. Because if you've only got three, four days in Vegas, and this used to happen, I used to do a show at the Downtown Grand on a Thursday night, um, and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd have all these people, mainly from the UK, that would contact me because perception looked good. And I'd be like, yeah, well, you know, make sure you hit my show too. And they'd be like, thanks, need you, you know, probably not going to do that. And it, at first I'd be a little bit offended, like, what? They, you know, well, they're contacting me, surely they want to see me. But then when you really sort of accept, hold on, they're here for three, four days, I can help them with everything else. And um, people will, c I'm better at a club like the Laugh Factory, like I'm there next week or whatever. It's, you need that mass fame to, if you're gonna be realistic as well, and if you wanna make money. If you wanna lose a load of money, well yeah, then just put, put your own show and you know, look at your poster every day and say, yeah, I've got a billboard, but are you making any money? <laughs> it's what a lot of people, you know, and it's hard, it's Vegas. One of the toughest things that I would think that you would have to do is to, is to keep your comedy up to date. Uh, uh, what was comedy five years ago is not what comedy is today, I would think. We're going to take a break for a couple of seconds. When we come back, I want to talk about what it takes from Paul Scali to keep your comedy to where it is, that you, you even self-produce what you do, and you do other things that, that keep you going. So we're going to take a break for a couple of seconds. When we come back, I want to talk about that. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hey, it's Mark Chinook from Monday's Dark and you are watching Under the Vegas Sun with Steve Shore. Comedy, it is so different sometimes to figure out what is comedy and what isn't comedy. What makes something funny, what doesn't make it funny? A very special guest again on the program, a comedian very well known in Las Vegas, Paul Scali. Welcome back to our program. I would think the toughest thing for a comedian is, is to keep what you do fresh enough that the audience still sees it as comedy. And I would think probably what's funny in England, in the United, United Kingdom, is maybe not as funny in America. How do you, as a comedian, who faces an audience all the time, how do you keep it to that level where the audience says, ha ha, my side's hurting, I gotta, I gotta stand up because it's just killing me. Yeah, so I, uh, I always want to be relevant and, uh, and, and very real because the audience straight away, and in this day and age, you know, everybody's seen the best or, or most jokes have all been written or, you know, uh, there, there, there is so much out there to people to pick and choose from. You just talk about Washington, D.C. can be an entire show. There you go. There we go. Oh, <laughs> I haven't spoken about that. Um, I, I have an advantage sometimes, sometimes it's a disadvantage because I am, you know, from the UK, so if the audience... Really? Knows, I thought you were from Alabama. Yeah, they are, just, uh, oh, okay. just that side. <laughs> I've been to Alabama. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, I talk about my story, and so that is very unique and real because, you know, how, how I've done it. You know, I'm not saying I'm the first English guy to be in Vegas. Uh, but my story obviously is, and, and I make fun out of myself and, 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 and how I got to where I, I am, and then I have to keep up to date with what's going on around the world. Now, I'm not very political, um, but I, I, I have to be in the moment as well. So what I'll do is, if I go to a venue tonight, I'll look straight away, I'll see that audience, I'll, I'll, I'll think about what's actually happened in the world or my world today, and I'll, I'll try and do 15 minutes on that because then I'm fresh straight away. You do a lot on your own experience. You do a lot on, on playing off on the things that you've been through in your life. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen that. That's really tough to make fun of yourself sometimes. Well, 
you know, again, be, be, being out here, because I've, I've, I've traveled the country now, so to start talking about people in Alabama, or Wisconsin, or New Mexico, or Vegas, or New York, or whatever, if I hit on them straight away, they, they could take offense to that and say, mm -hmm. hey, man. What are you picking on me for? It's happened before, and it's like, hold on, you're in, you're in America, you're in my country, shut up, you know? And they can shut the show, you know? Immediately. Immediately, and I've just alienated my entire audience because I was being a little bit ignorant to, you know, go to them first. Now, if I really crush myself first, so then it's like, hey, this guy's just killed himself. This is brilliant. They'll start putting their hands up. Okay, so tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong. I heard a rumor once, heard a rumor once, okay. that Paul Scally, in one of your shows, gave everybody who attended the show a gift. Yeah, I used to give away quite a lot of gifts. Yeah, the one gift that you gave away was a toilet seat cover. Now, now, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a little bit straight, and I understand that. But what, what came to Paul Scally to say, you know what, I think I'm going to give a toilet seat cover away to my audience. Do you know what? I met a guy, I met, I met this Chinese guy <laughs> at Infocom. Who sold you building? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 500 units. I had to buy 500 purple toilet seat covers. 500 toilet seat covers? Yeah, but they were like, you know, 10 cents each. So, I mean, it was... Um, they didn't have your face on them. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had all these toilet seat covers and then I thought, because I, some of the shows they give away like helicopter strip, uh, flights and stuff like that, uh -huh. you know? Uh, That's a little bit different than toilet seat cover. Different. Well, yeah, well, I had to, you know what I mean? They were getting expensive, so I needed something cheap and different. So is it true you actually gave away toilet seat yeah, covers? Yeah, the whole audience would walk away with these like, furry, purple toilet seat covers. And they, you know, I'm getting fitted here at the Liberace Mansion. It's, it, that's the type of difference in, in, in making people laugh, isn't it? That's the, that's the toughest thing, is to figure out what makes... I'm, I'm sure when... When you announced to the audience that you're giving away toilet seat covers, I'm sure there was a lot of laughter within the audience until they got a hold of them. Yeah, and then they were like, seriously, is this what we're getting? You know, <laughs> we paid extra for the chance to win this. Uh, yeah, it's got to be simple and random. If it's simple and random, that's not, you know, it's just easy. It's easier for the crowd to, to you know, soak it in. You self-produce. Yeah. That's a very tough situation, I would think, because... It, it, for your entire family, it depends on your ability to create a show that people will pay to come see. It's a lot of stress on you, a lot of pressure. Yeah, Th and that there is 90% of it. The actual getting up, putting on your pants, and starting talking on a stage, that's 10%. The, 90, the risk as well, that's, it, it is, because Vegas... The perception of Vegas, if you don't know, and obviously, you know, you and, you know, people that live here in show business understand it a bit more, but to the outside world, or anyone outside of Vegas, oh, you know, if, if you play in this city, you're, you're obviously, you know, hitting it big and everything, you know, you're getting paid. Obviously, you are getting paid, but you've got to make sure you have all the tools that allow people to hand over money. And I would think, I would think that the audience has a higher demand to go and cross their arms and sit back and say, okay, make me laugh, than it would be in Wisconsin or it would be in, in some place like that. Because here there's so many comedians up and down the Las Vegas Strip and downtown that they can go to any place and, and, and see a comedian. So I would think that's, that's even more pressure on Paul Scalley. Yeah, definitely. And there's some great comedians out there, so <laughs> in Vegas, you know? So you're up against people that, if, if they have fame as well, you already know their personality. You know, because you've, you've been watching them. Maybe it's from a TV show or a movie, or you just love, you know, their, their stand-up sets. So if you know about them, you're going to see them. And you, you know, it doesn't matter what they actually say when you get there, because now you're seeing that guy that you've loved for 10, 12, or one day, whatever. You know, we've had Matt Goss on the show, another, another uh, gentleman right. from the UK, and, and, and I know that uh, the Matt has been very, very successful in Las Vegas. A and I think maybe he was even more successful in the UK with his brother. And, and being a success in Las Vegas is a, is a tough thing in today's world. 
tough thing in today's world. How do you deal with that, Paul? Well, you gotta, you gotta stay there every, every week, every night. So, okay, tonight we had a, a good crowd and we sold some, some tickets to the show. That doesn't mean that next week it's gonna be exactly the same. You've gotta keep your marketing out there, the strategies, and um, you've gotta take care of yourself because you can't let Vegas consume you, which it does to quite a lot of people. And you still have to be husband yep. and dad mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. It's not like somebody going to an office from 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning until 5. It, it's a different situation that I think maybe the audience never, never understands how much of a, of a huge differential that is for an entertainer. I mean, you are an entertainer, and, and I think there's a lot of pressures. We've had a lot of entertainers on this show, from, uh, uh, from uh, entertainers, uh, name headliners on the strip, uh, to comedians from the different shows. There's a lot of pressure on those who entertain America in Las Vegas. Yeah, well that's it, because you, because you care so much as well. Before a show, during the actual show, when you're actually within the show, you care and you know, right, okay, these people are having a great time. These guys are very loud. I don't know what these people are doing over here. So you, you care. Like, all right, well, we've got to get everyone involved in this. And how much time have I already done? You know, where am I in, in the set? Have I got to slow it down? Have I got to speed it up? Um, and that is, that is the actual, you know, comedy product. And then at the end of the show, you think, how was that? Was that great? Now, if you want to spend a little bit of time outside with the crowd, but then, yeah, as soon as it's done, whether you're driving back to your to your home, you start thinking again, right, okay. Okay, tough question. Are you funny for you, or are you funny for the audience? If you're funny for you, does it bring the audience in? Or do you write things for the audience and hope that it's funny for you? That's great. I think I, um, if it's funny, if it's funny for me, then I kind of now, uh, after doing it for so long, no, all right, it's probably, if I find it funny, it's probably gonna be quite funny because I'm a critic now of so many other comedians and scenarios and premises and, and even myself. So I'll think, all right, that's good, oh, that's, that, that, that's not that funny, that's not that funny, we'll try again, you know? Sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong, but then you've gotta actually get it out there to the audience. And, have, and then have them decide, no, that is funny. Well, that you, are, you are funny. A and, and I appreciate you being on the show and being so very, very honest with us about what it takes to, to, to be a comedian as yourself, because I think it's a lot more than most people even understand. So, so thank you very much for being with us today. I, I, I really do appreciate it. You've been, you've been delightful. Thank you. Thank you. Much. You know, it, it is about comedy. It's about what makes you laugh. And I think sometimes in America we don't laugh as much as we should today. I think that uh, with everything going on, laughter is still the best medicine. We'll have some closing words in just a moment. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Frankie Shinta, downtown's king of entertainment. You're watching Under the Vegas Sun with Steve Shore. You know, as I said in the show, Paul is a very, very unique comedian. And I think his, his style of comedy is something that is so needed today because he talks about really what is happening in our world and, and sometimes making fun of it. And I think today we need to have fun. We need to laugh at ourselves just a little bit because it's become so much of a serious society. And I think anytime we can laugh, it makes us all better. Thanks for being with us. Don't forget, be safe and enjoy life under the Vegas sun.